In case this is your first time to the U.S. Center, thank you for coming. It's a public outreach and diplomacy space organized by the Department of State where we have lots of good events coming for the next week, um, the, basically the entirety of COP. If you want to schedule, make sure you grab yourself one or go to state.gov slash U.S. Center. All of this is live stream, so if you can't make an event, feel free to watch over the internet. And you can still ask your questions using the hashtag on Twitter, Ask U.S. Center. Without further ado, let's jump right into today's event with our moderator, Phil Duffy. Phil is the president and Executive Director of the Woods Hole Research Center. Phil? Good morning, and, and thanks very much for coming. Uh, t the title of today's event is The Melting Arctic, A Glimpse into the Future uh, of Global Climate Change. Uh, we have a, a panel of distinguished uh, speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, first, I, I'll uh, motivate a subject that perhaps needs no motivation, uh, the importance of climate change in the Arctic. As you know, the Arctic is warming uh, at least twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Uh, the changes that uh, are happening in the Arctic are not just, not just manifest, but actually striking. And uh, you're going to see today, this morning, uh, some beautiful illustrations of uh, many of those changes. The consequences of changes in the Arctic uh, in the region itself uh, are also uh, very obvious, and again, you'll see illustrations of those. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, the consequences of climate change in the Arctic are not limited to the region itself, uh, and indeed, some of the most uh, potentially important consequences uh, are actually global uh, in nature, particularly uh, sea level rise. And, and today's panelists are, are going to discuss uh, the global consequences as well. Um, Finally, uh, the United States has been a leader uh, in Arctic, both in Arctic science and in policy measures uh, to both mitigate and adapt uh, to climate change uh, in the Arctic. So the, the, uh, today's event really will focus on the four themes that I've just mentioned. One, uh, U.S. government research uh, in uh, the Arctic, the research itself. Uh, second, uh, the results of that research in terms of regional uh, changes in the Arctic. Thirdly, uh, the global consequences uh, of climate change in the Arctic. And fourthly, policy measures uh, led by the United States and internationally, again, to both mitigate and adapt uh, to climate change uh, in the Arctic. The first speaker this morning is uh, John uh, J.T. Rieger. Uh, J.T. is a hydrologist uh, with a particular interest in application of remote sensing. Uh, he works at the Earth Sciences section of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, what JT is going to show us is a series of animations illust powerfully illustrating uh, the changes uh, taking place in the Arctic. And I think uh, really uh, this, uh, this series of animations illustrates the power uh, of satellite remote sensing. It really shows you uh, what satellites can do in terms of uh, understanding changes on planet Earth. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everyone. So uh, as Phil, Phil described, we're going to walk you guys through from science to policy, right, some views of the Arctic. So this should be very exciting. So the first place we should start probably are some of the tools and data sets that are used to support science, our scientific understanding of, uh, of the Arctic. So the Earth is a very dynamic system, and everything is interconnected. Yeah? And satellites give us a new view of the Earth, different from what we would see from the ground. I love that it, in these images of the Earth from space, you can't see any political boundaries, right? So a lot of the data sets that come from NASA are used to support the science that underlies these COP negotiations. So we're proud to be a part of that. Uh, NASA currently has 25 Earth observing missions in space. And these are uh, internationally cooperative missions. And uh, we're very proud of them all. These are the data sets that are used to support science in the Arctic and the impacts of changes in the Arctic on the rest of the Earth system. So here we're seeing global temperature anomalies across the surface of the Earth from, eight, from about 19, 1880 to the present. Right? So this is a combination of in situ data sets and satellite data sets. We know that the planet is warming. Okay? 
you'll see the trend coming up here towards the end of the record in 2014. The last 30 years, we've experienced exceptional warming. The map shows how that warming is taking place over the, over the surface of the planet. The areas where you see more blue means there's been relative cooling, and the areas where you see more red means there's been relative warming. As Phil mentioned earlier, the changes in the Arctic are severe. The Arctic is experiencing about double the rate of warming of the rest of the planet, and that's having many consequences. One of the first and biggest consequences that's having is on Arctic sea ice. So Arctic sea ice extent is changing, but also Arctic sea ice thickness is changing. So if you look at this animation, you'll see changes from 1984 through 2016 in Arctic sea ice extent and thickness. The areas where you see gray in the Arctic, in the Arctic Ocean, that means the ice is relatively thin and is relatively younger ice. The areas where you see white means the ice is relatively thicker and therefore it's relatively older ice. So we're seeing those changes not only in the ice coverage, but in the ice age. And you may be thinking, oh, this is great. It's going to open up uh, navigation in this area. It's going to be really positive. But there's uh, unintended consequences from our actions, and there's a question of responsibility for those consequences. Other changes happening in the Arctic. This is Greenland. This is one of our big ice sheets on the planet. So in the, towards the North Pole, we have the Greenland ice sheet. And towards the South Pole in Antarctica, we have the Antarctic ice sheet. Using a satellite system called GRACE, which stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, we're able to measure changes in the mass of that ice sheet in time. Right? So this Gravity, this gravity uh, Recovery and Climate Experiment mission actually measures changes in the Earth's gravity field due to the movement of water mass. And so using that satellite, we can measure the changes in the mass of the ice sheet very precisely. You'll see the areas here where the ice sheet's losing the most mass around the edges shown in red, we see a nice seasonal cycle in Greenland, but a nice steady trend as well. And by nice, it's not really nice. It's just a, a clean, steady trend, right? Things are coming down steadily. And this is going to have other unintended consequences on the Earth system. OK, this is our images actually from Antarctica, but I've squeezed them in here to explain something about ice dynamics, OK? So these are aircraft surveys of a rift in the Antarctic ice sheet from an uh, aircraft mission called IceBridge. And this really shows you how ice can fracture. So ice doesn't just melt gradually, gradually, gradually and slip into the ocean. What happens with ice sheets is they'll tend to weaken at a point, a fracture will open up, and then a monster chunk of ice can just dump right into the ocean. And there we, therefore, we can get very nonlinear and very abrupt changes in ice contributions to the ocean and in sea level response. And that's something we should be aware of, that the changes in the Arctic may be nonlinear. They may go from things are relatively good to boom, things are really bad, really fast. One of the consequences of losing mass from land, losing water mass from the continents, is that water mass will go into the ocean. Therefore, it's going to contribute to sea level rise. So currently, about a third to a half of the rate of sea level rise is really dominated by contributions from our ice sheets. So Greenland is one of those contributions. This is a map of 22 years of sea surface height changes over the planet, measured by uh, Topex, Poseidon, as well as the Jason uh, satellites, about four satellites have contributed, a family of satellites over 22 years contributed to our knowledge of the, how the ocean is rising. We didn't really have that information before. We only had tide gauges around the coast. So this gives us a, a, a comprehensive picture of how sea level is changing across the planet. We're trying to find new ways at NASA to understand these changes in the Arctic. One of the exciting new ways is with a, a satellite mission called SMAP, which stands for Soil Moisture Active Passive. And this uses two bands of radar, an active uh, band and a passive band, to understand how soils are changing in time. So what we're seeing here is a spring thaw in the soils at high latitudes uh, between April 1st, 2015 and April 13th, 2015. So where we see blue here, that means the soil is still frozen. And where we see red here, that means the soil has thawed. One outcome that we expect from global warming is that soils at high latitudes will thaw earlier in the season. And they'll be thawing more and more over the year. So they'll be freezing less each winter. This has big potential consequences for the carbon cycle and big potential impacts on carbon climate feedbacks. So that's something we'd like to be watching. You can see in this picture, in just the course of 12 days, how much change has taken place across the entire region. So that melt happens really fast. Within the course of just a week or two, those soils go from frozen to thawed. 
And those changes could be happening even earlier with climate change. Something we need to be monitoring. So we talked about, you know, what happens in the Arctic doesn't just stay in the Arctic. It can affect other parts of the planet. And what we've seen is that if we have a warm Arctic, we have this very weird scenario where it can actually be colder at the mid-latitudes. Because the warmer Arctic will change, will cause changes in the jet stream, which can bring cold air from the Arctic down to, for instance, the United States. So this was a very cold winter experienced in the United States, 2013-2014 uh, winter, where we saw the second highest extent of freeze on the Great Lakes that we've ever seen in the satellite record, so since the 70s. So the Great Lakes were almost 90% frozen over. This is a very weird thing. But it's that variability in the jet stream caused by those changes in the Arctic that could be one of the unexpected consequences of Arctic warming. So I think I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to lay that foundation, and uh, I'm going to pass to these guys to get into some of the science. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Our second speaker this morning is David Weindorf. Uh, David is both a professor and associate dean uh, in the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences uh, at Texas Tech University. David is a soil scientist, and what he's going to do today is give us a short preview uh, of what's actually a full-length film uh, called Between Earth and Sky. Uh, and that film focuses on uh, the terrestrial uh, implications of climate change uh, in the Arctic. Good morning, and thank you all for having me here today. Between Earth and Sky, Climate Change on the Last Frontier is a feature-length science-based documentary film which explores the influence of climate change on Arctic soils and ecosystems through the perspective of soil science. Originally developed as a means of chronicling the Arctic soils field tour, the project evolved into a film whereby the interactions of soil, climate, and ecosystem dynamics are jointly considered. Aspects covered in this film include soil carbon sequestration, thawing permafrost, coastal erosion, sea level rise, forest dynamics, and the impacts on infrastructure and Alaska natives. Major funding for the project was provided by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Soil Science Society of America, Texas Tech University, and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. This is by far the most ambitious film project ever undertaken by Texas Tech University. The film is directed by Paul Allen Hunton and Jonathan Seaborn, both of whom have won multiple Emmy Awards for their documentary filmmaking. The film will debut in early 2017 and is currently under consideration at more than a dozen different film festivals, both domestically as well as internationally to include Sundance, South by Southwest, Big Sky, Berlin, Portland, Boulder, True False, Ann Arbor, Full Frame, the Colorado Environmental Film Festival, and the Environmental Film Festival in our nation's capital. The film features interviews with some of the top international scientists, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe among them, was shot in cinema 4K and features an original musical score as well as graphics. The hour-long complementary film, An Arctic Soils Perspective, is a more technical film in its nature. It's also been produced as an educational project for Arctic soil scientist training and higher education. Following film festival consideration, Between Earth and Sky will be offered for distribution through various television outlets as well as independent theaters across the United States. A college and university film tour is also planned in 2017. Beyond that, it will be available on streaming services such as Netflix, Hulu, iTunes, and others. For more information, I'd encourage you to visit our website, betweenearthandskymovie.com. I've got a whole stack of movie posters over here I would love for you all to take with you to your home. Uh, you can also follow us with the hashtag I am between Earth and Sky, and I hope you enjoy this preview. Thank you. There's one thing that threatens opportunity and prosperity for everybody, wherever we live. It's the threat of a changing climate. I met Alaska natives whose way of life that they practiced for centuries is in danger of slipping away. During the fall storms, when the waves hit on the rocks, we can feel it. Alaska is warning us. If we don't heed that warning, we too will see impacts at the magnitude they do. <laughs> We start to lose interior Alaska's permafrost. We're looking at fully 20% of the carbon on the planet going from the terrestrial system into the atmosphere. That's huge in terms of temperature change. There's still a lot of people that it's, a, it's difficult to accept the science of climate change. 
Every year is different, but at, uh, as far as any major changes, I can't say that I see any. We actually haven't begun the discussion about what good things there are going to be from climate change. The scientists have it figured out. We know what's going on. We know that climate change is happening, and it's going to be disastrous. We as a human are our own demise. I mean, they're feeling the, the impacts of a boom and bust economy right now. People who go drill for oil, they're paid a lot of money to lie. I don't think they get paid good enough. <laughs> and maybe it's already too late past that tipping point to make a meaningful change. Maybe not, but until you try, you never know. And as of right now, it's, it's just sit around and talk. OK, we know it's happening now. I mean, the, the evidence is, is there. You know, the, the global warming is happening. You don't even have to worry about the reasons or why for or what. I personally don't think money is a matter, but lives are. If we do not have a move soon, I'm afraid our island will disappear. We as humans have never conducted an experiment with this planet like we are with climate change. It means all of us making sacrifices. Well, thank you, David. Our third speaker, our penultimate speaker this morning is Dr. Steve Vavris. Uh, Steve is a senior scientist uh, at the Nelson Institute Center for Climate Research at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Steve, uh, like me when I used to be a scientist, Steve uses computer models both to understand and uh, project uh, future climate. Uh, and among Steve's uh, interests are uh, extreme weather events and how climate change affects uh, the frequency and intensity uh, of extreme weather events. Uh, Steve's talk this morning is, I think, a really nice overview, uh, both of changes taking place in the Arctic and uh, some of their regional and global consequences. Thank you for the invitation to come here this morning to talk about climate change in the Arctic, where the impacts of climate change are being felt probably more acutely than anywhere else on the planet. And one way to gain insight on these changes is to view them through the lens of people who have lived there the longest. And this was done in a compilation of interviews about 15 years ago uh, that has an interesting title, The Earth is Faster Now. And the title comes from one of the interviews they had with an Alaska native elder, Mabel Tooley, who said, weather patterns are changing so quickly, it seems the earth is mo moving faster now. And the rest of my presentation will be describing the ways in which the earth seems to be moving faster now, particularly in the Arctic. Probably the most obvious way to understand and feel that these changes of climate are through temperature. As JT mentioned, the Arctic is warming at about twice the rate of the global average. And you can see in this map over the last few decades, the warming trend has been uh, the most acute in the Arctic, and especially if you look carefully over the ocean regions of the Arctic, the, the darkest red colors. And we understand why that's so, and it's a direct consequence of the loss of sea ice, which acts like a, a thermal insulation layer. This is a, going to be a, a distillation of before and after shots of the animation that JT just showed. This is, first image is the ice cover at, as it existed at the beginning of the satellite era. So even after a season's worth of melt, the amount of ice was covering pretty much the entire Arctic Ocean in 1979. And you can see from the colors that the ice was very compact, about 90 to 100 percent concentration. If we fast forward toward today, and look at the all-time minimum in 2012, which was almost reached again in 2016 in September of this year, we see a very different picture. Only about half the ice cover remains, and the ice that does exist is much more diffuse. To put these changes into perspective, the amount of ice lost over this period 
is equal to the land areas of the six largest European countries, except Russia. And so this really puts in perspective that these changes are large scale. They're not just something happening in the small part of the Arctic. They really are uh, very regional in scale, very wide spread. And they have serious consequences too in a lot of respects that we're still coming to grips with and trying to understand. But one obvious one has to do with ecosystems. A lot of uh, animals in the Arctic uh, depend on the sea ice for their habitat. And in particular, two species uh, have gotten a lot of press coverage on this. Uh, those would be walruses and polar bears. And one dramatic image that circulated a couple years ago from the uh, Alaskan coast was these walruses. That mass there is an a area of walruses called a haul-out. And they normally would be out on the coastal ice but the ice was very slow to form that year, just like it has been this year. And so scenes like this will probably become more common as the climate continues to change in high latitudes. But there are also other socioeconomic impacts of the ice meltback. And a really striking image of that was what happened this summer with the Crystal Serenity Cruise. This was a, a tourism uh, liner that went through the Northwest Passage, shown in this yellow line. And that was a once impenetrable barrier. I mean, no one in their right mind would try to go through the Northwest Passage even a few years ago, much less in a passenger ship. But this company was confident enough that the ice had retreated to the point where they could count on a reduced ice coverage to allow a ship to pass safely through there. And they did, virtually without incident, as I understand. I think this is a harbinger of what's to come in terms of marine navigation and as well as uh, a more inviting Arctic uh, environment for things like energy exploration and extraction. It's not only sea ice that's melting, but also snow cover, particularly in the spring and summer. And, uh, and, and again, just like sea ice, snow cover is important for various ecosystems. It affects their habitat. It affects where they can live for protection in the winter. And it's also important energetically because the snow cover, kind of like the sea ice, is an insulating barrier and it also is very bright and white and extensive. And so it reflects a lot of solar energy to space and thereby keeps the Arctic cooler than it otherwise would be. So if we remove this snow cover, it probably will be an enhancement of the Arctic warming. And we know that the snow cover, particularly in the warm months, has been declining rather steeply. This year, in fact, was a record minimum in springtime snow cover in the Arctic and, middle, and uh, Northern Hemisphere. As shown in this map, the oranges and uh, light colors represent negative anomalies, so where the, ice or where the snow cover was unusually sparse. And you can see that that is pretty much the entire uh, Northern Hemisphere for the most part. And that's important because then that allows more of the springtime solar energy that's fairly strong at that time of year to be absorbed by the surface, land surface, and warm rather than being reflected off to space. One of the consequences of less snow cover or an earlier melt off of snow cover is that the soils warm sooner and they dry out more. And with that combination comes an increasing threat of wildfires. And here's an example, just a picture showing this. Uh, wi large wildfires in the Arctic have increased tenfold since the middle 20th century. And we think that that's largely due to a warmer climate and a drier soils. And that's important partly because they release carbon as they burn, and so it has global implications, and also because it leads to a darkened, charred surface, which again can absorb more sunlight. Another consequence of melting snow cover is its impacts on promoting more uh, thawing of the permafrost. So this image of permanently frozen ground in the Arctic shows that it's very extensive, especially in Siberia, and it's, uh, it, it stores a lot of carbon. And so if the permafrost warms and thaws, potentially an awful lot of carbon can then be released into the atmosphere, furthering the global greenhouse effect. The thawing of the permafrost also has some very big socioeconomic impacts that are very stunning when you look at them. Uh, people have built on permafrost for many years because it was safe to do so. But now that that permafrost is turning into a soggy soil, it has uh, big impacts, uh, roads collapsing, 
buildings crumbling, and even trees start to sway as the once stable ground beneath them starts to shift into a mixture of thawing and freezing cycles. Permafrost is also a good adhesive, and so when the uh, permafrost thaws, it promotes erosion. And when it happens along a coast and you get coastal slumping, you get an increase in coastal erosion. In addition, the sea ice loss, which acts as a, a barrier to the waves, dampening those waves during storms, as it disappears, you get bigger wave action and further loss of coastline. And Arctic coastline rates, um, the erosion has increased by a factor of two over the last uh, 50 years or so, and some areas are retreating at the rate of 20 meters per year. And that has led to some dramatic consequences. Villages in the Arctic are having to relocate if they're too close to the shoreline. The village of Shif Shishmaref, Alaska, this year actually voted to relocate because the encroaching coastline was getting to be too much of a hazard and eating up their buildings and houses. Another type of ice that's melting quickly is the land ice, glaciers and ice sheets. And here's just a, a picture that shows that in symbolic form. Um, the increase of meltwater from Greenland alone has gone up 500% since the turn of this century. And uh, a recent estimate was that the amount of ice lost each year is the equivalent of fit the weight of 50,000 Empire State Buildings. So this is a, a huge amount of loss. And one of the big consequences globally is that it promotes sea level rise. If all of the Greenland ice sheet melted, it would raise global sea levels by about six to seven meters, and that's the level that it increased at the peak of the last interglacial. So it has happened before. We know that sea levels are rising today, and the rate is going up. Uh, the, probably the best estimate, the standard estimate I'm hearing for the next century is about a one meter of sea level rise large error bars and uncertainty on that, but no one disputes that global sea levels will continue to rise in the future. And already we're seeing some of the serious impacts of that in the form of what's called nuisance flooding. So these are events that aren't life-threatening, but they're expensive, and they lead to uh, communities having to spend a lot of money to try to keep the water out. One area where that's especially pronounced is the east coast of the United States where some areas here in the dark blue circles are experiencing over a month's worth of days with nuisance flooding. And so they, they're having to spend millions of dollars to try to combat that. In this symbol, this image, I think is just a stunning symbol of uh, vulnerability to climate change. So sea level is not only important globally, but even within the Arctic. This village of, of Kivalina here is uh, at the end of a spit, and uh, you can see that they are uh, extremely vulnerable to sea level rise and encroaching coastlines, and they too are probably on the verge of having to relocate. But it's not only the ocean as a medium in which the Arctic affects the globe and outside of the Arctic, but circulation patterns in the atmosphere are probably also being disruptive as a result of Arctic climate change. And the reason for that is fairly simple. We know that these large scale uh, jet stream winds shown here in the yellow and red are a direct consequence of the temperature difference between cold polar regions and the warmer tropics. And as that temperature difference reduces, that reduces the strength of the westerly winds aloft, and it's those westerly winds that steer our daily weather systems. And so any changes in those winds have the potential to have big impacts on those of us living in middle latitudes, so possibly millions or billions of people could be affected. And this has uh, implications for the exchange of cold polar air with lower latitudes. So as an example, when the jet stream winds are strong and, and tightly packed, the cold air from the Arctic is essentially bottled up, and so it pretty much stays in the Arctic. And when the jet stream weakens, it also tends to become wavier, like a slower moving river becomes more sinuous. And so we get more of these buckles in the jet stream, and that allows the potential for pockets of cold polar air to move down to lower latitudes. And the example that I show here is the so-called polar vortex event that struck North America two or three winters ago, bringing some exceptionally cold air to the northeastern half of the country. 
But at the same time, if you look west, the, the other buckle northward in the jet stream was directly responsible for exacerbating the strong drought in California. So two sides of the same coin promoting extreme weather uh, from the, this buckling of the jet stream. And so a big scientific question that I and others are working on right now is does the warming Arctic lead to a significantly weaker and wavier jet stream? If it does, there's major consequences societally. So I'm going to close here summarizing what I would say are the ins and outs of Arctic climate change. So some of these changes are definitely happening within the Arctic, and uh, I summarize those here. As I said, the rate of global warming is two to three times faster in high latitudes than in the rest of the northern hemisphere. Just about every year now, we're seeing near record low amounts of snow and ice cover. And with that, as a consequence, comes uh, more wildfires and coastal erosion. But as JT pointed out, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And so some of the outs of uh, Arctic climate change globally are that melting glaciers and ice sheets raise uh, sea levels. Wildfires and thawing permafrost release carbon, although we're not sure exactly how much, but uh, it has a potential to be a large amount. And then finally, uh, the amplified Arctic warming affects large-scale weather patterns. We certainly think that's true within the Arctic, and to the extent that it spills out of the Arctic, it has uh, real serious consequences for all of us who live in middle latitudes and potentially even lower latitudes, too. So I will close there and uh, move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Finally this morning, uh, we're privileged to have with us Karen Florini. Karen is Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change with the U.S. Uh, Department of State. Uh, and Karen is going to talk to us about U.S. policy leadership uh, on climate change in the Arctic, covering both uh, aspects of, of climate change mitigation uh, and also uh, regional level adaptation. Thank you very much. Um, as we've, we've heard a number of reasons for prioritizing the Arctic as a, climate prior, as a, as a policy priority, uh, I think they can be distilled in two words, uh, two basic concepts. One is the impact on the rest of the world, the sea level rise that we've been hearing about and the potential weather impacts on the northern hemisphere. Uh, I want to mention, I just want to emphasize a little bit how significant the impacts as a result of uh, loss of sea ice and snow cover can be. When you have full, full sea uh, snow and ice cover, you get a very substantial amount of bouncing back of heat uh, into, the, uh, into the atmosphere. When you lose that and instead are having the sunlight go into ocean waters, that goes from about 85% bounce back down to about 7%. This is not a subtle difference, in other words. It, that then means that the entire global atmosphere's retention of heat is increasing substantially. And then, of course, that's exactly why all of us keep saying what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic and is of a great concern to the world in its entirety. Of course, the United States has significant Arctic territory in and of itself, the great state of Alaska. We've heard already about the impacts on coastal erosion, uh, uh, loss of buildings as a result of uh, um, the melting of the permafrost and the extension of the fire season, as well as changes in wildlife patterns uh, hunt that have profound impacts on hunting and fishing subsistence patterns that have lasted for uh, generations. So during the, uh, the Arctic Council is a, an organization of the eight nations of the Arctic that have territory in the Arctic states. So it's the Nordics, Canada, the US, and Russia. The chairmanship of the Arctic Council rotates on a biennial basis. We received the chairmanship from Canada uh, last year, and we will turn it to Finland next year. During the chairmanship, we have had four areas of focus. They are the Arctic Ocean, Arctic Communities, Arctic Climate, and Arctic Awareness. Climate, obviously, a major focus for the reasons I've already alluded to. Within the Arctic uh, 
uh, area, or the Arctic climate focus, uh, elevate as a policy priority, mitigate, build resilience, and strengthen the science. In terms of elevating as a policy priority, we've done things both as part of our chairmanship and in conjunction with our chairmanship. In the latter category, we held a major international conference last August in Alaska that invited a number of foreign ministers from around the world, as well as had a series of side events involving scientists and NGOs. It was very successful, and it kicked off um, a number of other events. And then there are, of course, things such as this side event where we are further trying to get the word out on the importance of the Arctic. In terms of mitigation, obviously carbon dioxide reductions are the big critical uh, element for the Arctic as for the rest of the globe. But I want to spend just a moment talking about uh, some other heat trapping substances, uh, in particular black carbon and methane. Uh, these are substances that have major co-benefits in terms of protecting health and protecting crops, especially for methane. Um, this diagram indicates uh, that as you reduce the black carbon and the methane, you get a significant nearer-term benefit. It doesn't necessarily help you all that much in terms of longer-term benefit, but these are compounds that have very uh, much higher uh, short-term warming potential than does carbon dioxide. Fortunately, they also clear out of the atmosphere much more quickly than does carbon dioxide. With regard to methane, for example, over a 100-year period, it's a 28, or roughly 28-fold more powerful, warmer than carbon dioxide. But over a 20-year period, it's about 86 times as powerful. So that means that reductions in methane and similarly reductions in black carbon can get you an awful lot of bang for your buck in terms of slowing the pace of warming over the next couple of decades. That's why uh, in last year's uh, Arctic Council Ministerial, the ministers adopted a framework for enhanced action on black carbon and methane, where they said, we commit to take uh, enhanced ambitious action to accelerate the decline in overall black carbon emissions and to reduce significantly our overall methane emissions. Key elements of that framework included national reports being done by each country. Observer nations were also invited to submit reports on their black carbon and methane uh, releases, national inventories, and were tasked to do a, an aggregate summary of methane and black carbon as well, um, to have recommendations for specific enhanced action and to come up with a goal for reducing black carbon. To operationalize this, an expert group was tasked with terms of reference, including development of a summary of progress and, progress and recommendations uh, with analysis and lessons learned and options for a black carbon goal. I want to stress that this is a biennial process during which the um, uh, so, so every two years there's a new chairmanship and there will be a new expert group. Uh, since the framework was just adopted last year, this is obviously the first uh, expert group that's been convened, and it's been my privilege to chair that this year. So the way that the Arctic Council operates is that uh, ex the expert group or other working groups develop materials and present those to the uh, senior Arctic officials, which, as the name suggests, is a group of senior officials who work on a long-term basis on Arctic issues. Um, they then are the ones who determine which specific uh, materials go forth to the, to the ministers for approval. Uh, and the next ministerial is in May of 2017 in Alaska. The expert group has, has relied heavily on a prior work done by the Arctic Council and its subsidiary bodies, including the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, as well as some prior task forces that have begun looking into these issues. We also relied very heavily on the national reports that were submitted by uh, the Arctic nations and several observer nations, um, as well as with uh, follow-up consultations in those countries and with broader experts as well. So because, um, because we have not yet had the uh, rec expert group recommendations approved by the um, approved by the senior Arctic officials. I can't get into a lot of detail, but I can tell you in a broad brush way that the sectors that we are focusing on include uh, black carbon from mobile sources, including shipping, um, oil gas methane leaks and flaring, uh, 
uh, solid waste management, which releases a lot of methane uh, uh, if you have decomposition of organic matter, and combustion, um, residential combustion of biomass. Um, we, we are still finalizing our recommendations. We are also coming, uh, developing options for a black carbon goal. Um, that is in a somewhat earlier stage of the process. We've had several discussions, and that will be finalized again as we submit our recommendations to the senior Arctic officials early next year. A, sec a, fourth, a third pri uh, priority within our Arctic Council chairmanship is building resilience. Um, and here there is a, a process underway building on the knowledge of Arctic change um, to, to develop an Arctic resilience action framework that's to align with international agreements as well as the commitments of the eight Arctic states. This framework has the goal of increasing the ability of Arctic states and communities to understand and respond to risk in ways that support communities and support ecosystems and a, a, to be sustainable and prosperous. It articulates shared priorities and areas for action for building resilience among the eight Arctic states, the six permanent participant indigenous groups, and the six working groups that variously carry out the artwork of the Arctic Council. Preparation of the framework was kicked off at a workshop this last March, and the draft has been uh, prepared with input from a lot of technical and policy experts across the Arctic, and is now being submitted, or has recently been submitted last month, as an initial draft to the senior Arctic officials. The draft sets out uh, four priority areas, um, including on an analyzing and understanding risk, building resilience, implementing measures that build resilience, and encouraging investment to reduce and build resilience. So that will be finalized in early 2017 uh, and submitted to the senior Arctic officials, and then uh, will go to the ministers for their consideration. Um, the framework is going to the greatest extent possible align with other major international agreements, uh, including on sustainable development, the Paris Agreement itself, of course, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and the last of our uh, four Arctic climate priorities is strengthening the science. Uh, in this context, there is a great deal of work being done um, by the uh, uh, snow, water, ice, permafrost in the Arctic, or SWIPA report. Um, some of the group's key findings uh, are that in the last five years have been the warmest on record. Sea ice thickness in the central Arctic Ocean has declined by 2.3 meters from 1975 to 2012. The nine lowest sea ice extents have occurred in the last nine years. And that the, the Arctic is the dominant regional so source of global sea level rise. I'll stop there, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Karen. So we have the room uh, until 11.30. Uh, we have a couple uh, walk around microphones and we have uh, therefore time for uh, any questions from the audience. So please just raise your hand and I'll come and uh, hand you a microphone. Okay. Well, I can start off with a question, uh, a question for JT. Uh, and that is, I, you know, I, I know that any given satellite has a relatively short lifetime. And uh, perhaps you'd like to comment on uh, the need for continuity uh, in satellite observations and also on uh, any missions planned in the, in the near term that are particularly important? That, that's brilliant. I think you, I think you nailed it. Uh, I think uh, our role as a NASA scientist is as data providers, our role at NASA in general is as data providers for, for scientists as well as decision makers and, and policy makers. And I hope that you can see that connection between the data and the actual policy changes that, that uh, need to happen so that we have informed decision makers. That's, that's the goal and better scientists. Uh, as uh, Phil just said, you know, there's an argument for continuity of missions because the changes in the Arctic haven't happened over such a long time frame. Satellites have been great, but satellites have a finite lifespan. They're only going to last for usual mission design is about three years, maybe five years. So when that mission stops, uh, 
the data stream stops. So there's definitely an argument for continuity of missions, for having the same mission relaunch several times. And uh, certainly for the Arctic, this is one of those cases where this would be a, a really important development. We work on about a 10-year cycle at NASA in, in the strategic uh, planning of a mission, the design of a mission, the, the building of a mission, and then the launch of a mission. So I think that uh, for continuity, uh, the Arctic is one of those key places where that needs to be considered. Yeah. Thank you. We have one question over here. Hi, so I'm a student representative from the American Chemical Society, and um, I'm uh, particularly interested, I studied chemistry in university, but I'm particularly interested in the process and the dynamics of science communication. Um, so I'm wondering if um, each of you could maybe speak a little bit about um, kind of some of the struggles with making, especially with the, your film um, and with the, the science that you do. Uh, I think it's difficult, scientists are, are pretty busy doing science, so how, how can we, especially in the US where we have huge um, domestic disbelief related to climate change, how, what kind of ways forward do you see with communicating your work? Sure, so let me, let me address that. It's a wonderful question and really was a justification for why we wanted to do this film project. I attended a conference a few years ago and the speaker said, you know, we do such a great job of conducting the science, the NASA people, the, the people at universities, but we do a horrible job of communicating that to the general public. And that's really what the, the purpose of this film is, is, to, is to do, is go out and, and communicate this, not necessarily in this venue. When I'm up here presenting the clip to you, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys already know what's going on. The idea is to get this word out to the general public through the film festivals, through television distribution, through discussions and forums at colleges and universities and interested communities. And really, it's a grassroots kind of effort. I mean, we have a website, we have a hashtag, we have all those kinds of things. We're trying to make a big social media push, but the more everyone can help get the word out, that's where you really start to get this groundswell of buy-in. If I can add to that, I, you know, uh, as someone who's been working on this for several decades, I, I really do see more and more young scientists, uh, especially scientists who work on problems like climate change, which have obvious societal relevance, I see more and more of them embracing the communication uh, aspect as part of their job, as part of their responsibility as scientists. And I think it, it's, it's really heartening. Um, sure. Yeah, just a, a comment on my mic working. Yeah, just hold it close. OK. Um, so a couple of things. One, I'm always accused of depressing everyone when I give talks, especially about <laughs> Arctic change. So I'm, I'm tr trying to find ways not to. So that's one piece of advice I'm trying to take for myself. But the other one, more practically, is and this is fairly easy to do with the Arctic, is it helps if you go with something that has made a big splash in the news already, like the Crystal Serenity Cruise I mentioned, or the walrus haul out image. Some of these things that they capture the public's attention already, you don't have to invent it and then say, okay, now this is a teaching moment. This really represents something bigger and here's the bigger picture as I see it. So I think that's one way that, uh, to help with science communication. Another is to come up with, with uh, succinct, memorable statements. I was very pleased to hear two of the scientists' colleagues up here today use what has become my favorite phrase, which is what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. For one thing, many, many people don't realize that. Um, and you know, even people who may not feel that they have particularly strong feelings about the Arctic or necessarily care all that much about Arctic communities or ecosystems, although obviously everybody should. Um, but for people for whom that's a lower priority, we need to find ways of succinctly communicating and reinforcing that they have an interest as well. Sometimes when I start talks like this, I, I ask um, the audience, please raise your hand if you have a direct personal connection to the Arctic. And then I say, it's a trick question because the answer is everybody does, and here's why. So I think short, short, memorable statements often repeated are also an absolutely cru crucial part of science communication, especially on a topic as complicated as climate. Thank you. All right, we have a question here in the back. Uh, I'm Victoria Herman of the Arctic Institute. So there were a lot of photos of relocating villages, particularly the 2005 one of Shishmaref. And I was just wondering if any of you foresee additional funding or capacity building resources being allocated to villages that are going to be re relocated beyond the 
uh, funding announced at Glacier last year? That's a question for Congress. Go ahead. I'm uh, Lars Otto Reisner from Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program under the Arctic Council. Thank you for very good presentations and thank you, Karen, for showing the latest SWIPA report, which shows what's happening in the Arctic on the cryosphere, the melting of the glaciers, the sea level, sea ice, the sea level ice. Those of you who are interested to know the latest, I welcome you to Washington in April because we will release the SWIPA 2017 report two weeks before the ministerial meeting to try to trigger even better discussions with the politicians of what's going on and what would be the right actions to take. So uh, you have heard a lot of the interesting information and we will come with some updates both on, the, on most of these areas in uh, April. And if you want to learn more here, there's an Arctic session tomorrow at the Nordic Pavilion the whole day. Thank you. Well, th thank you for that. I, I, I think these uh, scientific syntheses are uh, and the, and the, the presentation of those in, in, where policy members can access them is really important. But did you have a question? No, okay. Uh, so I have a question for Steve, if there's no immediate question from, oh, there is one, okay. Hi, my name is Joanna Mills, I'm from the UK. One of the most influential climate doubting journalists in the UK wrote um, a piece a couple of months ago saying the Arctic has been ice free before but it was about 8,000 years ago what's the problem and I wondered how you would respond to that yeah so I hear that a lot too um, the climate's always been changing so what's the big deal if it changes in the future well we understand that the mechanisms for why the the Arctic may have been seasonally ice free 8,000 years ago I don't think it's a definitely known but um, we know that there are changes in the Earth's orbit that affect climate on very long time scales, thousands, tens of thousands, hundred year, thousand year time scales. Those are very different time scales and different processes than the climate changes we're expecting over the next decades to a century and beyond. And so the fact that the Arctic was ice free 8,000 years ago in the summer, perhaps, what's the big deal? Well, I would say that that's not really an apples to orange, or apples to apples comparison. I would say that those are very different time scales and processes that, that isn't all that relevant for the questions we face. However, to the extent that someone is gonna latch on to that information, I would say that's even more reason to be concerned because we know then from the paleoclimate record Certainly, if not 8,000 years ago, we know, say, 125,000 years ago during the last interglacial, uh, that the Arctic was largely ice-free in the summer. And so we know what the system's capable of doing. This isn't just a climate modeling exercise that may or may not happen. We know the system's capable of being extremely warm compared to present day, and also capable of uh, much colder conditions uh, as it was during the last ice age. So the, the past climate record is very useful, I think, for giving a sense of how uh, pliable or malleable the Arctic system is, and we know that it is very, very flexible. And to me, that's an even re greater reason for concern about what's ahead. Sure, I, I, would, I would say succinctly, um, sure, tens and hundreds of feet of sea level rise have happened before. Uh, mass extinctions have happened before. Doesn't make it okay. And it particularly doesn't make it okay when you have hundreds of millions of people and billions upon billions of dollars of infrastructure in coastal areas that will be inundated um, uh, or at least subject to, to, to very significant amounts of, of routine flooding. That's not, that's not an easy thing. I mean, look what happened in New York City as a result of Superstorm, Superstorm Sandy, where the, you, know, you, you had billions upon billions of dollars of damage in a very wealthy country for months and months afterwards, you had people still living without electricity and displaced from their homes. So any, anyone who thinks that this is kind of a nothing burger isn't really paying attention, I would say, to the, to the coastal maps of the world. Okay, I have a question then for Steve, and, and this is about, uh, again, about the ice-free Arctic. And, it, you know, a, a, as the previous question illustrates, there's a certain symbolic importance to having an ice-free Arctic in summer. So what's the latest science on the projections of, of when uh, that's expected to happen? And how, how sensitive is that to 
climate policy? Or is that something that's largely locked in at this point? So the first part of, about answering that question is that in, people ask me that a lot. When will the Arctic Ocean become ice free? And the important distinction to make is that it will depend on the season. So even for the very foreseeable future, we think that the ice cover will exist in the winter time. What we're talking about in terms of an ice-free Arctic Ocean is really the summertime melt-off. And climate models generally predict that sometime in this century, probably in the next 50 years, the, uh, the first instance in our lifetimes of an ice-free Arctic summer will occur. And that will uh, have symbolic value, and it also have some practical importance too. Um, probably we can't pin that date down to plus or minus 10 years because of just natural fluctuations in weather that we can't predict. Some summers are better for melting ice than others, for example. Um, but uh, if and, and when it happens, it probably will be the first time in thousands of years that it's occurred. So it's very important historically. And in terms of how locked in we are, the estimates that I've seen are that in the high-end greenhouse gas scenario, the so-called RCP 8.5 situation, uh, probably by around 2050 is most likely when uh, the ice would melt off in the summer. Uh, with a more conservative approach, maybe uh, another 10, 20 years. Uh, but with the most optimistic, the RCP 2.6, uh, it looks like the ice could basically stabilize and uh, we could avert that uh, ice-free a melt-off situation. Thank you. Do we have any questions still from the audience? Okay, so then that concludes the session. Thanks, thanks very much for coming. Right. Appreciate it. Let's your give time. our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.